Okay, so this afternoon's speaker is uh, Cédric Boutillier from uh, Sorbonne, who's going to tell us about Diamond models and Riemann surfaces. Thank you. Thank you. So first, I would like to thank the organizers for this uh, program and the opportunity to to present uh, this work uh, here today. So I will uh, report on a recent work uh, in collaboration with uh, David Simazoni from Geneva and uh, Beatrice de Tillier from uh, Paris Dauphine about um, minimal dimer models and uh, maximal Riemann surfaces. So I will start with uh, some recap about um, dimer models. We, we saw already a lot of material in uh, uh, Kurt's talk uh, yesterday. So first I will uh, start with a finite bipartite graph, G. So it has white and uh, black vertices. Um, and white are only uh, neighbors to black vertices and vice versa. And uh, I will look at uh, dimer configuration on this graph. So what are dimer configuration? Matchings of the graph. So a subset of edges such that every vertex is incident with exactly one edge. So an example is given by the pink uh, configuration here. And uh, I'm I suppose that I'm given some positive ed edge weights and I can uh, create this uh, partition function, which is the sum of all uh, dimer configuration of the weight of a configuration, which is just the, the product of the, of the weights. Okay, so it's a um, classical result from statistical mechanics uh, dating from the 60s that uh, this partition function for planar graphs can be computed as a determinant of a matrix. Uh, so this matrix is now called the Castellin matrix, which can be seen as a twisted bipartite adjacency matrix for the graph. So in the, my convention today would be to, to have uh, rows of this matrix indexed by white vertices and columns by black vertices. The entries of this matrix are in uh, absolute value uh, given by the weight of, uh, of the edge between uh, the corresponding two, two vertices, W and B, if they are connected. If they are not connected, it's just zero. And um, there will be some signs or uh, some uh, complex phases uh, ensuring that um, when you compute the alternating product of the entries of the Castellan matrix around every face of your graph, you get a fixed uh, sign. It's a quantity with a fixed time, which depends on the, on the length of the, the cycle. And then the, the theorem. Uh, due to Castellin and uh, temperley fisher is that uh, the partition function of the uh, dimer model uh, is given maybe up to a uh, complex number by the determinant of this uh, Castellin matrix. So, is there a reason uh, this um, So it, it works also for non bipartite graph. Now you need to use a larger matrix with rows and columns indexed by all the vertices and uh, look at the Pfaffian of this uh, matrix. But uh, since uh, in what comes next, I will focus only on bipartite graph, it will be, uh, yeah. So yes, yeah, there's a more general theory, but uh, here in this talk, I will focus on bipartite graph, planar bipartite graph. Sorry? W and B are the points of the graph. Sorry, I cannot hear. It's not on. No, it's on. W and B are the point on your lattice here. So B and W, they are uh, vertices of my graph. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. uh, w, w will mean O. Oh. Uh, wait. So this is uh, so W means a, a white vertex and the B means a black vertex. So since my graph, there is only a black N and, and um, okay. So if W and B are connected by an edge, the absolute value coefficient of the matrix is edge. Uh, if they are not connected, it's zero. 
other question. So if the partition function is not zero, we can define a Boltzmann probability measure on the set of uh, dimer configuration by just saying that the probability of my dimer, my random dimer configuration is proportional to the weight of the edges it uh, contains. And uh, now you can uh, start looking at local statistics. So if you take, for example, uh, k distinct edges on, on my graph, uh, you can ask what is the probability that in a random uh, dimer configuration sampled uh, by this um, Boltzmann measure, these k edges appear um, in this random uh, dimer configuration. And uh, it's uh, like a classical formula of uh, a linear algebra that this can be expressed as uh, the product of the coefficient of the Castellan matrix times the determinant of a minor of the inverse of the Castellan matrix, where the indices here, are the, the vertices here, are only uh, limited to, to the one appearing in the edges I'm interested in. So for k edges, it's just a k by k uh, determinants, um, whatever the size of, of the graph. So this defines me a determinantal point process on the edges of the, the graph. And um, yeah, it's um, interesting uh, and has very nice uh, properties. And uh, you can say a lot of things about um, dimer configurations on the finite graphs using this, uh, this formula. So it's uh, uh, very, very nice. So the question is now, how can you generalize this construction to infinite graphs? Because when you have an infinite graph, it may happen that your, part well, your partition function will become infinite. So now there is no uh, Boltzmann measure anymore. So one, uh, big work in, uh, in this direction was uh, an article by Kenyon, Okunkov and, and Sheffield in 2005, where they uh, explain how to um, uh, uh, describe um, generalization of Boltzmann measure in um, Z2 periodic uh, planar bipartite uh, lattices. So uh, I will suppose now that my bipartite planar graph is uh, biperiodic and the weights are also periodic. So you can now define, again, uh, a Castellan matrix, which is now a periodic operator. And you can look at the, the Fourier transform of this operator. So it will now become um, a finite matrix indexed by uh, black and white vertices in a fundamental domain. So uh, let's say this part here. So for this graph, it will be a four by four uh, matrix, but it will depend on uh, two extra parameters, Z and W, which are um, uh, multipliers associated to trans horizontal and vertical translation uh, of, uh, of my graph. Uh, so if you look at the, the determinant of this matrix, you get a Laurent polynomial uh, in Z and W, which is called the characteristic polynomial of the, of the model. And if you look at the zeros of this uh, polynomial, you get some algebraic curve, which is called the spectral curve of the, of the model, which in fact contains a lot of probabilistic information about the, the, the model. So it turns out that uh, the spectral curve you get is uh, special. Uh, it's a so-called Harnack curve. So it's um, um, a type of um, real algebraic curve which has some um, properties. So in, in particular, it is maximal. Uh, so I will come again to, to this uh, terminology uh, a bit later, but it means that it has the maximal number of real components and also the, the, the tentacles of this uh, curve, which correspond to points uh, going at infinity, uh, they have some well-defined uh, cyclic order. Uh, so from this uh, spectral curve, in particular, you can construct two uh, dual objects in a sense. So the first one is the Newton polygon 
of uh, the characteristic polynomial. So it is just the uh, convex, convex hull of um, points in the lattice which appear as degrees of monomial in, in my characteristic polynomial. So if I take again this example, um, the characteristic polynomial will have uh, uh, five monomials which are represented by these five points and the Newton polygon is just uh, the convex hull of these, uh, these points and um, the probabilistic interpretation of, of this is the set of slopes for the height function for any Gibbs measure on, um, on the ergodic Gibbs measure on this on the set of dimer configuration of this uh, periodic graph. And another object you can construct is the so-called amoeba of the spectral curve. So it is obtained by just looking at the log of the absolute value of Z and W for points on the spectral curve. So it gives you a, a, a two-dimensional picture. And um, so on the axis, you, you get two parameters which are uh, dual to the slope of the, of the Gibbs measure. They can be sought as an external field and um, the, the amoeba uh, describes the phase diagram of the, the dimer model uh, when the, well, in, in the space of this uh, external field. So we, we can see a different uh, region which correspond to the different phases that Kurt described in his, his talk. So um, when you are in the, inside the amoeba, so it's the yellow part, you will get um, a, a Gibbs measure which corresponds to a rough face. When you are in a bounded component of the complement of this amoeba, you are in the smooth, okay, in smooth phase where now correlation decay exponentially fast. So in the rough phase, the correlation decays uh, polynomially. And in an unbounded, um, unbounded uh, compon uh, connected component, you are in a solid phase where um, some edges has, have probability uh, zero and or one to be in, um, in a dimer uh, configuration for the corresponding Gibbs measure. So every point in this diagram corresponds to a certain Gibbs measure um, related to my weights uh, I, I am given at the beginning. And all these measures, they, they are determinantal. So for every point here, you get some inverse of the Castellan matrix, which can be expressed um, as a Fourier coefficient. Uh, and so for every point here, you get a determinantal process. So for um, planar bipartite graph, which have this uh, translation invariance in uh, two directions, uh, you can somehow um, extend the formalism we, we saw for a finite graph uh, in, um, in a larger context and with a lot of information encoded by this uh, spectral curve. In fact, uh, we can say more about this. So it turns out uh, that uh, any Harnack curve can be realized as the spectral curve of a uh, periodic uh, dimer model. So this is a result by Kenyon and Okunkov. And uh, we will uh, come to this uh, again uh, later. So now I would like to ask the same question for uh, families of graphs which are not uh, periodic anymore. So in which context uh, can we uh, describe the inverse of Castellan operators to define uh, measures in infinite volume for infinite uh, planar bipartite graphs. So I will uh, not look at uh, any um, uh, infinite uh, bipartite graph. I will put some restriction, but for that I need a notion, which is the notion of train tracks or uh, zigzag path. So this is something you can uh, draw for any uh, planar uh, planar bipartite graph. 
So a zigzag path, for example, is um, well, one zigzag path is given by this blue path here. So the zigzag path, they are uh, paths drawn on the okay on the plane, and they they go around uh, vertices. Uh, they go around black vertices in a uh, uh, clockwise fashion and around white vertices in an anti-clockwise fashion. So they make a like, zigzag like this. Uh, so you can see another one like this and uh, like this. Okay, so for bipartite graphs, they have a, a natural orientation by saying that uh, they always have Black, uh, black vertices on the on the right and white vertices on the on the left. And I will look at um, infinite uh, bipartite planar uh, graphs with bounded faces, which will have a certain forbidden uh, patterns for train tracks. So um, I will consider mainly uh, two two classes. So the first class on which I will focus are minimal graphs. So these are the ones appearing in my, in my title. Uh, they were introduced by uh, Thurston. And so what you forbid is the presence of, so uh, a train track is not allowed to intersect itself. And uh, two train tracks cannot cross more than once in the same direction. And uh, so there is a, a smaller class which is uh, maybe uh, more well known, which is called the isoregion graph, which has been uh, introduced earlier uh, by Merca uh, with the terminology of uh, critical maps for the critical Ising model. And then the terminology of isoregion graphs come from uh, Kenyon, where now you forbid not only the, the self intersection and the double intersection in the same direction, but also double intersection in um, opposite directions. So this, um, this constraint, so if you forbid these patterns, uh, you can define um, some partial cyclic order on the set of train tracks of your, of your graph. So if you look at uh, non-parallel uh, train tracks, so meaning train tracks, uh, crossing at least uh, once, you take th three of them. If you look at a big ball containing all the possible intersections, then if you look at the exit point of the arrows, they will have um, a well-defined um, um, order. And this uh, cyclic order is, um, is consistent uh, in the graph if you uh, impose these two, uh, these two conditions. Yes, the, it's, it's true, yes. So, um, indeed, so you, you when you go around the you you are crossing two successive uh, edges. Uh, yes, you you have to go. And uh, so, uh, for example, this this vertex here is uh, something which makes the the graph non-minimal because if you draw uh, the the train track which would go through this edge like this, it would make a loop like this. So it's an example of a uh, forbidden uh, pattern you can, uh, you can have. Yes, so I draw all the possible train tracks and uh, I want the set of train tracks to, uh, to not have this, this kind of... Uh, and so inside here, you, you could have other um, intersections and uh, I, so this is like the, uh, yeah, the, the minimal pattern you, you, you forbid. Okay, so um, one um, example um, of situation where uh, 
uh, construction of inverse of Castellane matrix uh, was successful in uh, this general context is uh, the so-called critical isoregal uh, models described by Kenyon in 2002. So they, they are called um, isoregal, uh, they are called isoregal uh, uh, graphs or isoregal uh, model because uh, if you uh, have this, um, these forbidden patterns, uh, you can show that uh, there is a way to, to draw your, the, the graph in the plane in such a way that every edge is the diagonal of some rhombus of uh, edge length, say one, and this uh, rhombi, they make um, a tiling of the whole plane. Okay, so a, a, a way to construct isoregiograph is just take um, a, a rhombus tiling of the, the plane, like maybe the Penrose tiling on other type of, of, of tiling, and then take um, one uh, every second vertex and uh, draw an edge for uh, like you pick a diagonal to make the, the edge of your graph. So since I'm looking at bipartite graph, you need to ensure that the graph you, you create like this is, is bipartite. But uh, you can see that in fact, every train track here um, will cross uh, edges which are uh, parallel uh, in my uh, rhombus styling. So you can associate to every train track a uh, unit complex number which which correspond to to this vector um, spanning the this uh, this um, this uh, these edges of the the rhombi and um, uh, Kenyon defined uh, a Castellin operator uh, like this so every time you you get a, a white and a black neighboring vertices you get two train tracks with parameter ei alpha and ei beta and uh, define the, the Castellane matrix by being the, the difference of the, these two parameters. So the first uh, striking thing is that um, if you take this choice, um, this operator satisfies the Castellane condition, meaning that if you compute the alternating product around every face, you get the, the sign you need to, to make the, the proof of Castellane theorem uh, uh, work. So uh, it has um, a well-defined uh, sign around a, every face. And uh, even more striking is that it's possible to give an explicit inverse for this Castellan operator. So how does it work? So I want to compute the inverse between uh, a black vertex, okay, a black vertex here and a white vertex somewhere, somewhere else. I take a, a path in the rhombus graph uh, connecting these, uh, these two vertices. So it's made of uh, unit steps. And from this unit step, I create some um, uh, rational fraction uh, by taking lambda minus uh, the, the parameter as I, um, I, I see along my path. And some of these factors will go in the numerator, some of the denominator, depending on some uh, orientation convention. And you multiply by the log and you take a contour integral. So you have to uh, enclose all the poles of this uh, rational fraction and um, uh, avoid the, the cut of this uh, logarithm. So it defines you some well-defined operator for every uh, well-defined coefficient for every pair of, um, of uh, black and uh, white uh, vertices. And uh, it's, the, it's an inverse for the Castellane matrix. So it has an even more striking property, which is the fact that um, it is local in the sense that it depends only on the geometry uh, along the path between uh, B and W you, you took. And in fact, um, the, the, the product itself doesn't depend on the path. So you, you can take uh, any path between B and W, modify your isoregal graph outside of this uh, path, 
As long as it stays uh, isoregal, you get the same, um, the same expression. So using this uh, locality, uh, Beatrice Dutillier showed that, in fact, it can be used to define a uh, probability measure on the um, set of dimer configuration on these isoregal um, on this isoregional graph, and that this measure has some locality property, uh, which is uh, like a, a very nice uh, feature. But uh, in fact, uh, this work um, raises many questions. So first, it is not uh, very clear, at least for us, it was not very clear why this is this works, so it seems that the formula for the inverse uh, Castellan matrix is, uh, is it's magic, and uh, we wanted to understand uh, if it uh, if it's possible to have similar expression for more general weights, uh, and uh, we wanted to understand uh, what was the um, the reason for this uh, this magic. Was it related to some uh, integrity? Um, other questions that arise came from the fact that uh, if you uh, look at isoregal graphs, you can compare um, the, um, the theory by, by Kenyon for isoregal graph and the one for Kenyon, Okunkov, and Sheffield. So Kenyon had like one inverse for its Castellan matrix, but uh, in the periodic case, you expect to have a two-parameter family of inverses. So how do you explain this? And the other thing is that uh, if you look at the spectral curve for um, these uh, critical weights, you always get a spectral curve of genus zero, uh, which are uh, parameterized by the Riemann, um, Riemann sphere. And somehow you can uh, see on this Riemann sphere the, the unit circle on which um, leave your um, the, the parameters associated to your uh, your train tracks. So we wanted to to find um, a framework where we could uh, generalize this construction um, to to some extent. So for um, several years we we have been working on uh, specific examples, uh, generally generalizing the this work. So. Uh, there were situations where you could um, generalize this. Uh, so there is, in the same paper, Kenyon, this like critical Laplacian where you have trigonometric conductances on isoregal graphs. Then we looked at graphs corresponding to uh, Ising model on isoregal graphs, so critical with trigonometric weights or uh, non critical with elliptic weights. But uh, so what I will talk about is uh, a generalization win, which in, in fact encompasses every, everything we, we had uh, before uh, to work not only on isoregion, but on the larger family of minimal graph and with um, curves of genus uh, larger than one. So what is our, um, our setting? So we want to be able to work uh, simultaneously with all the minimal graphs I, 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 I've presented at the same time. And uh, what we want to do is to replace the, the Riemann sphere by some uh, Riemann surface of uh, higher genus. And this Riemann sphere, is, is this Riemann surface will play the role of the spectral curve of the, the model. And this is something that we, we, we take a priori. So it will not be defined a posteriori from the weight of the model, but uh, we are first given this Riemann sphere and then this Riemann surface, and then we will construct the, the weights on all these minimal graphs. Yes, yeah, so the, 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 the graph li lives in the plane. So what is of higher genius is, um, um, is, is this, the spectral curve is higher genius. Yes, thank you. Uh, and then when, when we have these, uh, these a priori data, we will construct Castellan operator then 
families of inverses, try to read some probability quantities from, uh, from the geometry of the Riemann surface sigma. Yes, so for example, the square octagon lattice uh, I had on my picture, it's not isoradial, but it's uh, minimal. The square octagon, yes. yes. Okay, so what will be my, uh, my curve? So my Riemann surface will be a maximal curve, so it's an abstract uh, compact Riemann surface of genus uh, G, uh, which is endowed with an anti-holomorphic involution. So you can think of, for example, an, an algebraic curve uh, described by a polynomial with a real coefficient, and this uh, involution would be uh, just the complex uh, conjugation. Or you could think of, uh, in case of genus one, this is like, uh, uh, a rectangular torus, okay? And um, so I want this curve to be maximal in the sense that uh, if I look at the fixed point of this involution, it has the maximal number of connected components. So uh, this maximal number is, uh, is, is G plus one. So really in genius two, the picture should look like, like this. So in genius two, you have three components uh, which look like topological uh, circles. And um, so you use um, uh, G of them and complete them to make a symplectic basis for the homology group of, of the surface. The, the other one, A0, you, you keep it uh, for the moment. And you... Um, you need to uh, define a, a bunch of uh, geometric objects. So first you start by defining uh, an adapted uh, basis for holomorphic forms uh, on, the, on the surface. And from this, you can then construct a, a Riemann matrix, which is just the, um, the, the set of numbers you get when you integrate you, your basis of holomorphic form along the cycles bi of your homology class. So the bi would be cycles going vertically around. So b1 like this and b2 like this. And for a um, maximal curve, the, this matrix uh, omega is uh, very nice. So it's pure imaginary. And the, the, the imaginary part is symmetric and positive definite. So from this, you can construct um, other geometric objects, so the Jacobian of, of the, the surface. So maybe I, um, so, you, okay, <laughs> you can construct the, the Jacobian. So just by, um, if you have like formal combination of points on, on your surface, you can uh, cook up like a G tuple of a complex number by integrating uh, your G uh, differential form uh, against uh, a long path be connecting the, these points. And these are uh, well defined up to some uh, lattice. And so when you look at the, the quotient of the uh, CG divided by this lattice, it's the so called Jacobian of the, of the Riemann surface. You can then define the Riemann. Riemann theta function, which is the g-dimensional analog of the classical Jacobi uh, elliptic functions, which can be seen as a quasi-periodic function on this Jacobian. And from this Riemann theta surface, you can uh, build the prime form on sigma E, um, which is a, a bit difficult to define precisely, but uh, it's the basic block to construct meromorphic functions with uh, prescribed zeros and poles on the on my Riemann surface sigma, so it's um, it it has two parameters which are two points living on my uh, Riemann surface sigma, and uh, it's uh, zero if and only if the the two parameters are equal. So you can think of it as the higher genus analog of just the 
the difference uh, u minus v, which is the basic block to construct a rational fraction with a prescribed uh, poles and, and zeros. Okay, so this is some uh, geometric uh, data coming from the, um, the Riemann uh, surface. So now I will uh, look at my uh, minimal graphs. So remember the, the train tracks of the minimal graphs, they have um, a well-defined partial cyclic order. So now I will assign to every train track um, a parameter, which will be a point on my surface uh, in the component A0, which was uh, put apart. So it, it will um, correspond to the space of, of uh, parameters for my train tracks. And I want this map to preserve the cyclic order of the, um, of the, um, of the train tracks. So train tracks have a partial cyclic order. A0, it's a circle, so it has a well-defined uh, cyclic order. And I want this map to um, preserve the, um, the cyclic uh, order. So here ar around this wide vertex, you have um, three uh, train tracks uh, coming in uh, order T1, then T2, then T3. So I want the corresponding parameter to have the same order on the uh, component A, A0. And then the next ingredient I need is the discrete Abel map, which is defined on faces, white and black vertices of my, of my graph. So formally, you can see this as a linear, formal linear combination of points of A0, and you should think of it as a discrete antiderivative of this uh, uh, parameter map alpha. So it, it's defined as follows. So you take one phase where you set it to be the empty uh, linear combination, and then every time you move from a phase to a, a black vertex, you will add the parameter of the train track you are crossing. And uh, if you go to a white vertex, you subtract this parameter. And uh, if you go from the white to a face, you then add again. Uh, so there is a, some rule to know when you add, when you subtract. But it's, it's a well-defined map on my, um, on my graph. So now with... Uh, no, so it's... Uh, add in the sense of formal linear combination. Okay. So now you can, uh, I, I can give you a formula for the Castellin operator I uh, will uh, look at. So it's a, a formula, in fact, um, which was given by uh, Falk in a paper in 2015 where he was interested in the problem of um, um, if you um, forget about uh, positivity of weights, etc., you, you take an algebraic curve and you wonder if you can construct a graph on which the, the spectral curve given by the determinant of the Castellan matrix would be this, um, this algebraic curve. And um, he came up with this, uh, this formula. So um, I have my uh, maximal curve. I fix some parameter t, uh, which is a real point in, in the Jacobian. So you can think of it as just a, a, um, a point in Rg, if you want. And uh, for a minimal graph uh, with a set of parameter alpha, uh, you define the Castellan matrix of this form. So for every uh, edge between a white vertex W and a black vertex B, uh, with two parameters uh, carried by train tracks alpha and beta, you get the prime form, uh, depending on alpha and beta, divided by a product of theta function, which depends on T, and the discrete Abel map uh, of the two neighboring faces. Okay, so it's... Um, it's some definition, but um, it turns out that if uh, I make all the geometric um, assumptions on my object here, this operator uh, again satisfies the Castellin condition. So this is not the, the weights of the dimer, it already contains the, the complex faces, 
which make uh, things work well from the point of view of um, Castellin uh, theorem. So from um, the geometrical object, you can now construct a very um, interesting set of uh, functions which are in the kernel of this uh, cast operator, which are uh, defined in a similar way to the uh, rational fraction we, we saw in Kenyon's construction. So you first define, um, so it will be a set of functions indexed by um, uh, pairs of vertices of my graph and a parameter u, which is just a point on the surface sigma. So you fix u, and now um, you, you define these little factors. So uh, for a w or b neighboring uh, a face f, you get some uh, special uh, factor defined in terms of the uh, Riemann theta function and the prime form. And uh, if now I take a black vertex somewhere and a white vertex somewhere else, I can look at a path alternating between vertices and, and faces of my graph. And um, I will have uh, train tracks crossing this, uh, this path. And uh, I'll define the, the function GBW to be the product of these local factors collected along the, the path. And um, so it turns out that uh, these uh, functions, the first are uh, well-defined meromorphic uh, one forms on the surface sigma when I look at them as a function of u. And moreover, they are in the kernel of, of k, uh, well, which is exactly the, the relation uh, you see here. So on the, on the left side, but also on the, on the white side. And the, the proof of this proposition relies on phase identity, which is a, a functional identity satisfied by the theta Riemann function and the, the prime form. Um, so I didn't have space to write the, the formula, but it's really, um, it's a, a nice uh, application of um, this uh, functional identity uh, to, to prove discrete, um, uh, like discrete differential, um, uh, discrete, um, discrete difference equation. Uh, maybe I skip uh, this. Uh, so from this uh, function G, we are now able to construct a whole family of inverses for the, for the Castellan matrix uh, by doing the, the following. So I have my surface sigma. So if I cut it along all the cycles A, I will split the surfaces in, in two parts. So I call sigma plus the upper hemisphere. Um, and I take a point u0 on this, um, on this set sigma plus. And uh, now I define for any pair of uh, vertices b and w, uh, the, the, this coefficient a u0 of b and w as the, the integral of this uh, one form, gb of w we had before, uh, on a contour which uh, goes from um, the, the image of my point u0 by this uh, in, um, involution sigma to u0 itself. And it has to, um, to cross uh, a0 at a, in a very specific region. So this, uh, this function has, in fact, um, uh, on A0 uh, has a very nice property. So all the zeros, so you can really split A0 into two components where you have zeros on one side and poles on the other side. And uh, so I want my contour to um, cross A0 in the region where I have no poles, only, only zeros, so that I able to, to move this contour a little bit by of the, of the poles. And it turns out that these uh, operators, they are somehow the um, uh, higher um, genius generalization of, of um, Kenyon's construction because they, 
all satisfy um, local uh, locality property because the G was defined as a product along a, a path. So I'm a bit cheating here because there is some non locality hidden in the, this uh, discrete Abel mat, which appear still in two of the factors uh, of this function G. But um, we can do uh, more. So under some technical assumption, you can use this operator to define um, a probability measure uh, on dimers of all the minimal graphs. And you can uh, read, in fact, the, the phase diagram of all these dimer models on the position of u0. So this sigma plus can play the, the role of, um, of the phase diagram for the, for the model. So how does it work? The, if the parameter u0 is itself on a0, you get uh, a solid probability measure of frozen region, a uh, frozen measure. If A0 is in one of the other uh, real components, either A1 or A2, you get a smooth uh, measure with uh, exponential decay. And otherwise, you get a uh, rough measure. No, so, so every AJ corresponds to um, a given uh, smooth phase. So if, if you stay on A1 and you move your point U0 along A1, you get always the same measure. But if you jump to A2, you get another measure. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Uh, okay. Maybe. Uh, how much time? Um, kind of gone out. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Maybe I just uh, show the the slide. So we can now uh, look at what happens when we uh, specify our minimal graph to be um, furthermore periodic and see how this gives some new insight about the theory by uh, Kenyon, Okunkov and Sheffield. And um, it turns out that um, we can describe um, a lot of things um, in terms of the, of the geometry of, of the, the curves, but maybe I will uh, show this uh, theorem, which is, um, like a, a refinement of a result uh, of the result by Fock I was uh, talking about and uh, give some insight about the spectral theorem by Kenyon and Okunkov. So Kenyon and Okunkov uh, said that uh, we have like a bijection between uh, weights on uh, periodic uh, graphs up to gauge transformation and Harnack curves with some uh, fixed um, Newton polygon plus what is called the standard divisor, so marked points on every oval of your of your curve, but the the construction is um, so the construction in one direction is quite uh, it's very explicit, but the other way the other way uh, was not from their work, and uh, we were able to uh, uh, explicit construction of the inverse. Um, inverse bijection, uh, meaning that if you fix a Harnack curve with a standard divisor, you can always uh, find a maximal surface, some minimal periodic graph with parameters such that the spectral curve will be this Harnack curve, and you can uh, describe the divisor. Um, uh, you can describe the, the di divisor, and we have a bijection between the set of divisor and the parameter t uh, I had in the definition of the, um, the Castellan operator. So uh, maybe I will just let this slide here and thank you very much for that. Are there further questions? Are we still using the mic? Philippe?
Oh, is this still of some purpose? For the online. Uh, I have a basic question about this mysterious function E that appeared. Yes. In the genus one case, can I think of it as maybe theta function of U over V or something? Yes, yeah, so uh, in uh, genus one case, the, both the theta function and E are uh, classical uh, Jacobi theta functions. Right, right, okay. Yeah. It may be the same, but in uh, genus zero. Okay, so genus zero is a, a bit problematic because uh, there is a lot of uh, generacy, the generacy uh, com uh, coming in. But um, uh, if you take carefully the limit, what happens is that the theta function becomes just one, mm -hmm. and uh, this is just uh, alpha minus beta. So. Mm -hmm. Now you should think of these alpha and beta to be in the unit circle. So the, these are really the EI alpha and EI beta I had before. And this really becomes the, the, the weight by, by Kenyon. But there is no, no way to, to make the, the geometric formalism work exactly in genius zero case, but you can recover it by looking at the genius one case and make the, um, your torus become uh, uh, infinitely high. Well, you, you still have the same three type of faces, right? Yes, yes. Okay. So... <laughs> Just pass it around. <laughs> um, from, from, from these uh, marked points, can you recover the slopes of the gas regions? Sorry, I can... from, from the marked points on, yes. on the torus, can you recover the slopes of the gas regions in some way? Uh, can I recover what? The slopes of the, the gas slopes? regions. Um, uh, so the slope, so it's in fact uh, something that, uh, boo, 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 boo. it's here. Uh, so, in fact, uh, the slope of the gas phases uh, come from uh, mark points, but um, not from mark points on the uh, on the surface, but from mark points on the new So, in fact, if you look at the uh, a minimal graph with periodicity. And you just impose that the parameters alpha are periodic. This is not enough to ensure that the Castellane operator I constructed is periodic itself. So you will get a set of uh, two additional equations to make it periodic. And if you look at solutions of this, this will give you, um, in fact, G distinct integer point in the Newton polygon. And the uh, mark point in the Newton polygon will correspond to the uh, slopes of the G um, uh, gaseous phases uh, in, in your model. A naive question on something on which I'm confused. If you take your favorite example of the square octagon tiling and you perform a number of urban renewal moves, you end up with a square lattice, yes. which is isoradial. Yes. So your promise to say, well, we want to understand uh, the role of young bugs and integrability. Well, how does it happen that we can do the square lattice, we can do urban renewal because it's a triviality, and we end up with something that needed your new theory. Maybe we can use the urban renewal to bring the new theory back, or we know that there is something more, at, at which extent we can use the urban renewal to simplify the graph to start with? Um, okay, so if you, so every uh, bipartite graph can be reduced to a minimal graph by doing a set of uh, elementary transformations, and one of them is this urban renewal or spider move. So 
when you are inside the class of um, uh, minimal graphs, uh, you can uh, apply this uh, spider move or urban renewal to stay inside this, uh, this class. Uh, but sometimes you become isoradial. Yes, but uh, it's not clear to me uh, if you all you can always uh, end up with something which is isoradial. And um, and it's true that um, so you can do this construction for isoradial graphs, but if you look just at uh, Kenyon's weight, you always get spectral curve of genius zero. So if you want to have uh, something of high genius, um, even on either video graph, then you need this, um, this, this formalism. And it's well adapted if you want to um, find weights. For example, you want to be sure that on your favorite um, periodic lattice with very big um, uh, fundamental domain, you want a spectral curve of genus 17. Well, you know how to do it. You take your Riemann surface of genus 17 and do this construction, and you are guaranteed that the spectral curve will have exactly the geometry you want. Any final questions? No? Okay, well, thank you very much again. Thank you.